Hello and welcome to today's Chapter 1 event uh, from Dimix. My name is John Page, I am from Dimix and our very special guest today is best-selling author Matthew Riley. Matthew Riley. Matthew Riley is one of Australia's biggest selling authors, having sold over seven and a half million copies of his books. And he's joining us today live from LA, where he's now based, to talk to us about his latest Jack West Jr. book, The Two Lost Mountains, which has raced to number one on the bestseller lists. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Hey, John. It's really good to be here. Good to see you again, too. So tell us where about Jack West Jr. Where is his adventure up to in this sixth book of this blockbuster series without giving away any spoilers? <laughs> That's right, no spoilers, uh, which is really hard to do. Uh, you're right, we, we are six books in now. We've had Seven Ancient Wonders, Six Sacred Stones, Five Greatest Warriors. Then there was a break. Then it was Four Legendary Kingdoms, Three Secret Cities, and now The Two Lost Mountains. Um, after the four legendary kingdoms, uh, Jack had to face two trials. The first was the trial of the cities, which we saw in Three Secret Cities, but as many of my readers will know, that one ended with a, a bit of a doubtful scene, um, which gets resolved on page one of Two Lost Mountains. And what Two Lost Mountains sees is it sees Jack racing and chasing the villains in this series, notably Sphinx, uh, and his, uh, his Catholic helper, Cardinal Mendoza. Uh, and we will see a, a new player come on the scene, uh, a general who once worked for the four legendary kingdoms, uh, who is, let's just say, pretty out of control. Excellent. Now, we've got a fantastic competition um, at Dimmick. So if you are a book lover member and you can sign up for free if you're not, and you purchase the new uh, Jack West Jr. novel, uh, Two Lost Mountains, before December 24, you can go into the draw to have your name featured in the final Jack West Jr. book um, when that comes out, possibly next year, Matthew, or another two years away. I can neither confirm nor deny. Whenever, whenever the last one is, Jack will be a character in that book. Now, I want to ask you, Matthew, are you going to be nice to the winner or are you going to do, or do you have some other plans for whoever wins that competition? I think there's a very good chance that the winner will die a very gruesome death, which is what I reserve only for the people I like the most in my books. And I will say I, I can neither confirm nor deny, but I'm hopeful that the one something something uh, could come out next year. But no promises yet, but I'm, I'm hopeful. It all depends on me and how quickly I write. <laughs> Maybe this will add some extra pressure. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, when I sat down to do Four Legendary Kingdoms, uh, I really was setting up not only four, but three, two, and one. And so I do view Three Secret Cities, Two Lost Mountains, and The One uh, as one sort of big story. So... I, I did have number one mapped out a couple of books ago. Excellent. So, yeah, so if you're a, a, a Jack West Jr. fan and you haven't bought your copy yet, uh, buy it from Dimmicks. Make sure you're a book lover. Sign up if you're not and you can go in the draw and you can be immortalised in a Matthew Riley novel. You'll be there forever. Um, thanks for um, allowing that competition for Dimmicks as well, Matthew. That's a, a great competition. Now, back to Jack West. So you start, as you said before, you started with Seven Ancient Wonders and have been counting backwards with each book in the series. Mm. Does it add any extra pressure to you that you've you committed to seven up front? An enormous amount of pressure. Uh, it, it, truth be told, I wrote Seven Wonders just to see if I enjoyed this sort of Indiana Jones on steroids kind of story with ancient places and booby traps and all that sort of adventure. And really it was when I wrote The Six Sacred Stones that I was I was committed to a seven-book series. And I'm really pleased that a lot of the twists that I put into Six Sacred Stones are really still being revealed right now. There was an enormous amount of clues uh, hidden away in Six Sacred Stones. Uh, but yeah, you, you find out once you once you write Seven Wonders and Six Stones, then people are absolutely expecting you to do all the way down to one. I, uh, I, actually, while I'm here, I, I can see some of the comments up there. So I, I see we've got people tuning in from India, from a mine in the Northern Territory. Fantastic. Hello and welcome. 
So on the on the flip side then of that question though, what happens after you've written one, whatever it's going to be called, um, and you want to write more Jack West Jr. stories, or have you got a plan for that? You know, after I write the one, I'm going to have a good lie down. <laughs> uh, it's no, uh, honestly, when I when I set out to do the seven book series, I, I wanted to do a series which really tied together all of the strange ancient places uh, around the world and. And I was pleasantly surprised with links, uh, the, the link between, say, Stonehenge and the pyramids at Giza, uh, which I revealed in Six Stones and Five Warriors. That's real. And I loved the idea that, that I would connect all of the ancient places around the world. So when I finish the one, I will have used them all up. There will be none left. So if I do want to have a, another Jack West story, I'd have to come up with something else. I mean, maybe, you know, we had Scarecrow cross over into the Jack West world with the four legendary kingdoms. Maybe I've had a lot of fans ask if I could return to Scarecrow. Maybe Jack West could make an appearance uh, in a Scarecrow story. And Laura just had a good comment that came up on the screen there as well. What about a, a zero as a book title? <laughs> as I said, uh, let me put it another way. If Three Secret Cities, Two Lost Mountains and The One are one big story, I'm, I'm a good way through The One right now. The whole book is climax. The whole book is a non-stop series of climactic scenes. So I'm literally going off the charts with this last book. <laughs> There's going to be nothing left on the field. Um, so I, I could go through to zero, I suppose. Um, you never say never, but I, I, in all honesty right now, having done four Jack West books in a row with the Secret Runners of New York tucked in there, uh, it'll be nice to, to jump back into something else. Uh, hello, Hobart. Hello, Blue Mountains. I just try and say hello to the people, the, the places I see. So you obviously do, um, you have a lot of fun with the research you do for all the Jack West books. Um, where did your research take you for this new book? Uh, well, uh, again, without doing, uh, I'll, I'll mention a few places, but I'll try not to spoil them for, for the readers. Um, Mont Saint-Michel appears in this book. And Mont Saint-Michel, for those who don't know, is in northern France near the Normandy beaches. And if you want to open up another screen on your computer or your, uh, your iPad, uh, have a look, look it up because Mont Saint-Michel is one of the most stupendous, magnificent sites in the world. Uh, I visited it back in 2003 and I put it in my short story, The Dead Prince, but it really is a scene stealer in uh, The Two Lost Mountains. I'd also, and this isn't so much of a spoiler because it was uh, prefaced in Three Secret Cities, I looked into the moon and I did a lot of research into the moon landings and as Hades said to May in The Three Secret Cities, it was the fourth moon landing which was the important one. And so I actually did a fair bit of research into where the different moon landings took place and getting giving Jack a pretty impossible task in Two Lost Mountains involves the moon. <laughs> Hello, Mudgy. <laughs> I've been to Mudgy. I was in Mudgy years and years ago when Ice Station came out. So, and what do you like most about writing a Jack West Jr. novel more than your other books? And what do you find the hardest when you are writing a Jack West Jr. book? What I enjoy, uh, it's, it's actually funny, what I enjoy the most, are the, I enjoy the high action and these just huge scale action scenes. But it's actually those moments where Jack interacts with regular people that I enjoy more and more. Uh, you know, back in, it might have been Six Sacred Stones, uh, Jack went to a, a parent-teacher meeting at Lily's school went back when she was about 11 or 12. Uh, in Two Lost Mountains, uh, again, uh, no spoilers, but we have a flashback to Jack going to her school for a bring your parent to school day for a careers day. And I love the idea of just this guy who's out there saving the world, saving the galaxy, saving the universe, sitting in a schoolroom, you know, in, a, in an undersized school chair and 
Lily, Lily and, and Albie have really humanised Jack over the course of six books and he sort of started out as a scarecrow-type character, this real badass sort of guy. But Lily's really softened him and I, I love the scenes where we see him in regular circumstances because the, he, he looks like such a fish out of water or, or a, a lion or a tiger out of his cage. Uh, what's the hardest part? The hardest part is keeping on making it difficult for Jack and maintaining just this relentless, relentless speed. Uh, it takes me about seven months to write the first draft of one of these books. And then there's another five or six months of just revision, 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 just making it as fast as humanly possible. Uh, and it's, it's difficult for me to just keep making it fast. Um, if you think Two Lost Mountains fast, wait till you read the one. It's a rocket. Excellent. So the other thing you're known for with the, this series, though, is uh, leaving us on some big cliffhangers. Um, what are some of the good? What are, what are some of the reactions you've got from readers to the cliffhangers you've left us on? Uh, yeah. So after the cliffhanger in Six Sacred Stones, a lot of people weren't that happy. Um, <laughs> that was a pretty, you know, brutal cliffhanger, and I learned that my big fans uh, they read my books in the first few days, and they're the ones who had to wait two years for the five greatest warriors, whereas all well, the Johnny Come Latelys now, uh, uh, and I've met a few now who've blazed through the first five books and are jumping into the two lost mountains. Um, when you finish these, when I finish the books now, and it really began with four legendary kingdoms, I wanted to have a little uptick at the end. And at the end of four legendary kingdoms, after Jack survives the great games, we got this, this image of one of the coffins in the underworld opening, uh, which leaves the reader with that little, oh, something else is going to happen. The end of the Three Secret Cities, you know, the, the scene about Lily and what had happened at uh, the sacrificial ritual at the Rock of Gibraltar. So I do know we're going to, I think my readers understand that we are barreling towards the seventh and last book. And so I think my readers will be aware that not so much cliffhangers, but there will always be this sort of little uptick at the end to prepare you for the next book. Um, uh, hello for, to everyone from, from Melbourne there. Uh, if you do write me questions, uh, I'll try and jump on Facebook after this and I'll, I'll answer some of the questions in writing as well. So I, I can't sort of talk and write at the same time. And we'll throw open to some questions from um, people out there after after this as well. So you'll get, you'll get a chance for Matthew to answer some of your questions as well. Um, so your books are like big budget action films, but without the budgets. Uh, as a reader, it can be hard to keep up with the action. How do you deal with that as a writer and what impediments have you found to the, the no budget action blockbusters that you write? There is no impediment. I can blow up aircraft carriers and it doesn't cost me a cent. It's great. I love it. Um, even the movie people, you know, they read it and they go, there's not enough money in the world to make this into a movie. Um, you know, increasingly... I am drawing the sites that I write about now. And once I draw um, some of these sites, there are some underground structures in the Two Lost Mountains and they're quite sophisticated and complicated. I drew them and once I drew them, uh, which resemble basically the images in the books, you know, as they appear, um, once I draw them, then I only have to just describe my drawing. So as I make it more complicated, I, I draw the image first, and then I just sort of tell you what I see. And then blow it up. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, and basically the books start with a lot of things in existence and by the end of the book they're all destroyed. <laughs> um, so you own a DeLorean and you have a replica Han Solo frozen in carbonite. You've also got a helmet and you're a huge fan of the Marvel Universe. Uh, what other movies have been inspiring you lately and are there any new additions to your personal Hollywood collection? Uh, first of all, hello to Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I think my cousin Narell is there online. Um, what have I been getting lately? Look around my office here. Um, I've been enjoying Westworld, actually, uh, as a television show, so I, I got myself some... Uh, some Westworld stuff. I, I really love this image. And um, I think Westworld season one is one of the great seasons of television. 
Uh, season three wasn't bad. I think it promised more than it delivered. Um, the DeLorean is being driven around Canberra by a friend of mine. Uh, Django Fett is sitting up on the top of my, my cabinet here. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, I, I must. I bought myself a, a Millennium Falcon uh, as it appeared in the Han Solo movie. Now, the Han Solo movie may not have been the best Star Wars movie, but I really did like the reimagining of the Millennium Falcon with the escape pod uh, in between the mandibles. So a bit like I used to say I, I really enjoyed um, uh, Red Sun, the, Star the Superman comic book where they reimagined Superman as a Soviet superhero. I like it when people reimagine the Millennium Falcon with a, uh, um, you know, an escape pod in the, in the mandibles. Oh, and of course, you know, hey, Spider-Man, you know, Miles Morales. Um, your career famously started uh, after self-publishing contest. Um, publishing has changed quite a lot since then. How do you mm. think you would have done it differently if you were just starting out now? I honestly don't know if I would have been discovered. I, you know, so much about success in the world, there is timing and there is luck. And I think there are a lot of people out there who seem to think that, yeah, they were born for success and it was always going to happen. Sometimes you get lucky and sometimes the timing is right. And yes, contest got discovered in that bookstore in Sydney, but I hasten to add, no other publishers called me. Only one called me. So, you know, that's literally like, you know, riding across the desert and shooting your gun and having somebody riding on another horse shoot their gun and the bullets hitting in the mid in the middle. Um, I probably would be, you know, self-publishing in a digital format, uh, probably at a low price to try and entice people to read it. Um, you'd still have to do marketing. You still have to get people to, to, to find out you're out there. Uh, but, you know, I was self-publishing in 1996. It was a simpler time. I mean, you'd remember it, John, that, it was a time where you could walk into a bookstore and speak to the manager and they had the power to put your book on the shelf. Yep. And I just, that's just not the way it is anymore. No. It'd be, it'd be very different now. And I, I was fortunate that I was self-publishing at a time where books were still books. And I was self-publishing at a time when Pam McMillan in Australia were looking for a new thriller author. And that was, again, I had no way of knowing that. And Kate Patterson, God lover, walked in that month, found my book. Stars aligned. That's right. Now, you, um, you moved you away five years ago. Oh, there it is. There That's it is. Edition. Oh, there it is. Selling for $1,000 on eBay, I heard. I haven't looked lately, but, yeah, they were going for about 1500 bucks and uh, 2000 bucks at a charity I donated one to. Yeah. Half. People bring them to book signings. Some people find them in secondhand stores for three dollars. Oh, that's a gold mine right there. <laughs> it's the tracking that one. One man's trash is another man's treasure. <laughs> one person. You moved to LA five years ago. Uh, what do you miss most about Australia? You know, America is a. It's an interesting place. Um, haven't handled COVID that well. Uh, I miss, and I, I think maybe that's a good emblem of what I miss most about Australia, that Australia has a, a sense of the group and that we're all in it together. Uh, America is a very individualistic society and that is good and it's not so, it has other, you know, repercussions as well. I needed to come here uh, not so much for the books, but for movie stuff. I, I wanted to be more connected with the action movie world. And I've had a wonderful time here meeting movie directors like Philip Noyce, screenwriters like Stuart Beattie, um, uh, guys, uh, John Rogers, um, people who are, we, we just don't make those movies in Australia. And if I wanted to get more into that movie world, um, I had to come here. And, but yeah, beyond that, you know, I, I sort of miss that part of Australia where, you know, it's like the movie The Castle, you know, sort of, you know, get over yourself, that sort of thing. 
Um, and how has living near Hollywood changed what and how you write? Oh, it's an interesting question. I, it hasn't really changed the action, that's for sure. I did write uh, a smaller scale action thriller uh, in the hope that I would be able to direct it. And that's one of the things that moving to Hollywood did sort of shift in me, that if I wanted to make movies, I had to, I couldn't be writing a $100 million blockbuster because nobody will let you direct a $100 million blockbuster as your first film. But if you write a kick-ass little thriller that can be made for $10 million, they will let you direct it. So keep an eye out for, for maybe some news on that, hopefully soon. Ooh. And is I've, that been, I've been really <laughs> I wrote two of them. Wanting to see one of your novels on the big screen or even the small screen. Is there any other news on that front? Yeah, I sold. Um, I actually sold the Jack West series to Spyglass Media, a very big company, and they've got a wonderful writer named Jose Molina who did a couple of Marvel TV series uh, adapting it. So they're a big deal and they're the kind of company who can invest a serious amount of money in turning the Jack West series into a big television series. I used to sell movie rights, now I sell television rights more and more. Uh, I've got some people interested in the tournament, a uh, video game company interested in Scarecrow. Um, Great Zoo of China was close at Sony but didn't get made. Uh, you know, these things sometimes fall over. That was going to be a $120 million movie. And fell over it at a certain hurdle. So uh, there are a few things going on, but the Seven Wonders TV show, I think, is actually really exciting. Excellent. Um, and now what have you been reading lately? I've been reading a um, bit of nonfiction. I was reading uh, The Biggest Bluff, uh, a book about a woman who went on the uh, world poker, took on the poker world, and she was a psychologist. Fascinating experience uh, there. And recently I've actually been reading a fair bit of science fiction. I'm really enjoying world-building books. Uh, and I've mentioned it before, I enjoyed the Hyperion series by Dan Simmons. Uh, and actually just on my, my bedside table that I was reading last night was actually Isaac Asimov's original foundation, uh, which I, I, I remember reading that years ago and, and it still reads, you know, fantastically well today. I think Apple are turning that into a TV series as well, if I remember correctly. I saw, I'm going to say four or five months ago, I saw a trailer for the Apple Foundation series and have not seen it in months. So don't know what's going on there, but, yeah, I heard Apple did that too. Um, I think we're, we're in a golden age. We're actually about to come up to a golden age of television for science fiction because a lot of the people at Apple and whether it's you know Facebook or the tech companies, uh, they grew up reading Asimov and Clark and a lot of hardcore sci-fi. We could be seeing some class. I mean, we're about to see Dune redone as well. And Dune's had a couple of, you know, one was the David Lynch movie and then there was a TV series. And I'm curious to see what uh, Villeneuve does with it. Yeah, it looks good, but they get yeah. delayed as well, didn't it? As we get the movies, I think the release got delayed of June till yeah next year now. Yeah, along along with James Bond and Wonder Woman. Yeah, no reason. Yeah, there's, there's there's too much money at stake for these yeah. big movies. All right, so one last question from me, and then I'm going to throw it open to the audience. Uh, what next for you, Matthew? Are you we're going to have some more time travel, some more dragons? Are going to see Scarecrow come back or are you going to go something completely different once you finish with Jack West Jr.? Actually, it's interesting you should say that because I never did a tour for The Secret Runners of New York and I loved the time travel in that and I loved having a story in an empty New York City. I loved having different fonts for the present and the future um, and one day I'll, I'll have to do a series of talks uh, just on the Secret Runners of New York because I really, I always view these kind of talks as like a director's commentary to the book that I happen to be talking about and I never got to do that with Secret Runners and so the time travel in that is really intricate and it's a real mind bender to write 
a, a time travel story. I think I will do time travel again. I, I'm, I'm, what's next? I'm tossing up between bringing Scarecrow back because I not a day goes by when I don't get a Facebook message asking me to do a new Scarecrow book, and and I get that. Um, or coming up with a whole brand new uh, hero or heroine. Uh, so that's that's the choice to be made. But as I said, I'm I'm past halfway in the one. If I get my skates on, we'll get it out next year as opposed to the two-year wait, uh, which is definitely a goal of mine. Um, and as I said, when I finish the one, I'm just going to have a good lie down. <laughs> <laughs> you do, would have deserved it. All right, thank you for answering my questions, Matthew. So I'll throw it open to the audience out there. Here's our first question from Sarah. Um, who would yeah. you be playing Jack West Jr. in a series? If we could afford him, Chris Hemsworth. I think he's great. Um, uh, always, though, uh, actors get old really quickly, so if he doesn't do it in the next couple of years, we'll have to find the next Chris Hemsworth. All right, and we've got another, here we go, so from Karen. Uh, hey, Matthew, thanks for taking the time to answer this question. What can you tell us about The One? <laughs> That's a cheeky question. Oh, there's a, there's a minefield there. I mean, this is, you know, I can't even guarantee that Jack gets out of the two Lost Mountains alive. Um, uh, nice characters will die. Uh <laughs> We will we will be coming to the Omega event. Uh, I have written the single largest scale action scene in any of the books. I just finished that scene a couple of days ago, and it's just gig gigantic is not a big enough word for it. So I will tell you that it contains, it's the big finish, the whole book is a climax, and it's got the single largest scale action scene of anything I've done in the 17 books I've written. There you go. That's what I can tell you. And a Dinnick's book lover will have a character named after them as well. Yeah. Who may die a gruesome death. <laughs> All right. Now, question from Lisa. Any plans for a Black Knight origin story? Whew. You know, at the moment, no. Uh, but I will say that the Black Knight has been a really delightful addition to the Jack West world. Uh, he had the single greatest entry in the Three Secret Cities uh, with his, you know, plummeting uh, skydive and his rescue of Jack from a prison that has never been escaped from. Who's going to break you out of that sort of prison? The Black Knight. Uh, he is in the Two Lost Mountains. Uh, if he survives that, you might see him in the one. Um, but as my only issue with origin stories is that we always know the character's going to survive. So... If anything, I'd probably give him a new adventure. He's very, very popular. I love how we're calling it just the one now as well. It's almost like it's... Yeah, yeah but I, I should say that uh, I I don't even tell my publisher, you know, Kate Patterson at Macmillan, the title of the book until I deliver it. And, and I deliver now via email. So sometime around January she receives an email from me and it has the title of the book and I've done this with every book so she didn't know Two Lost Mountains or Three Secret Cities until it landed in her inbox so it's just nice for me that for a time I'm the only one who who knows the title and it's kind of something I sort of keep for myself at least for a while so yeah it's just always the one or the one something something but we're, we're, we've got there, 765432, and we're almost at one. <laughs> and Angelica, a question. Do you foresee a book with a female lead character? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I did it with the Great Zoo of China uh, and with the tournament. And, and the tournament occupies a, a very special place in my heart. I really do. There's something about the tournament that really appeals to me. It was a book that I sort of had to write. Uh, the movie... Uh, that I wrote, which I'm looking to direct, it's also got a female lead. Uh, as for the next book, haven't decided. Uh, so that's actually still up in the air. Excellent. And Alexander's got a question. Hi, Matthew. So Jack and Scarecrow are the same universe and there's a reference to the tournament at one point. So I assume that too. 
do yeah. your contests fit in at all or are they separate universes? I assume with an apocalypse level event. Uh, so, uh, well, I can definitely confirm that Temple is the same universe because in Area 7, uh, some of the Marines were discussing conspiracy theories and they mentioned the one, the story from Temple. Contest is a little harder because they'd have to talk about the destruction of the, the New York Public Library. Um, I like the idea, and, and mentioning the tournament, that's just me being cheeky. I, I just, that was, uh, uh, I love, uh, you know, as you said before, John, I'm, I'm an Avengers fan. I'm a Marvel's Marvel fan. I thought the 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 Avengers movies combining all the characters from the Marvel universe are just so fun that I realised when I did even even with Area Seven, once you have two characters or two series, why not say they're in the in the same universe, and then you have Scarecrow come into the Jack West series in Four Legendary Kingdoms or Aloysius Knight or mention Elizabeth in the tournament. Um, so for my mind, yeah, they're all in the same universe, absolutely. And if I could mention Contest, yeah, we'll say that one's there too. There's always time travel as well. But, well, you, you don't want to get too far into, like, what happened to the comic book worlds where they have, like, Earth 1, Earth 2, yeah. Earth 500, then you're then you're, you're really out there. I've got a question here from Mike. Any plan to make a sequel to a standalone novel? It's a good question. I often get people asking if I do a sequel to Temple. Um, same with Contest. Uh, the simple fact, if I haven't done a sequel to any of the standalones, Temple, Contest, Hovercar Racer, um, it's actually because I haven't come up with a good enough idea. And the, a sequel has to add to or be better than uh, the, the first book in the series. And uh, this is why I've continued on with the Scarecrow books and with Jack West. So um, at the moment, no. Temple was just too hard to do that again. And, and Contest, there is an idea I've got, uh, but a long time has passed. It'd sort of be like, you know, you know, making a sequel to Top Gun. And, you know, I mean, who'd do that? <laughs> I've got a question from Saxon. Um, I love that we can now label this the MRU, the Matthew Riley universe. I like that, MRU. Uh, we, we, we'll use, I'll use that. Thank you. better copyright that before the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Riley verse. Riley verse, that's pretty good too. Good idea, Mark. All right, have we got any other questions out there? Here's one from Jessica. Thinking of special anniversary editions of books, would you consider a special one for contests and having it set at the National Library of Australia instead of the New York Public Library? Oh, you know, um, it's it would create issues with the uh, the National Security Agency government guys sort of turning up outside. I just don't know if it works with you know members of ASIO or ASIS. Uh, turning up outside the Australian National Library. Um, and, you know, it's funny, when I when I put Australia in the books, I mean, you know, for 30, 36, 7 years I lived in Sydney, I always liked the the wild and sort of uh, far away parts of Australia, Tasmania for Hovercar Racer or or the deserts for, for Jack West's hideaways in Seven Wonders and the other Jack West books. Um, so I'd probably be veering away from the cities, uh, you know, city, Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth. I, I know them so well. I, I sort of view the books as my escape too. So that's why I sort of go to the wilds of Tasmania or Western Australia. Excellent. So what would be the uh, 25th anniversary of contest next year? Well, yeah, the, the self-published version came out in 1996, so that yeah. would be the 25th anniversary. Yes, I, I, I've been writing as a professional author for 22 years now. I, uh, I feel like people have watched me grow up. <laughs> We've got a question here from Sam. Did you always plan to have a Jack West and Scarecrow crossover or did it just happen? No, it wasn't planned. Um, it was only... Uh, I, I suppose this is a good way, a good topic to discuss, that 
the Jack West series sort of is in two parts. There's Seven Wonders, Six Stones and Five Warriors. And then I took a break. And the, these are very detailed books to write. There's a lot of history to put into them. And I just needed a rest. And so I went off and I did Scarecrow and the Army of Thieves. I did Trot Mountain, Tournament, Great Zoo of China. And, and then it was a few years later that I was like, okay, I feel like getting back to Jack West and, and resuming the story. And, and I actually just used the real-time difference to make a time jump of that eight-year period. So Lily and Albie were now, instead of being 12-year-old kids, were now 20-year-old, you know, young adults. Uh, and that was, it was only then that Scarecrow had been around and the notion of the great games, of having these champions who are either come to the games by choice or who are kidnapped to compete for one of the kings, uh, I just saw the opportunity to put Scarecrow in there. So... I can't say it was planned from the get-go, but it was only something that could have happened uh, with time. And uh, Rachel's asking, how did you come up with the grey stone? Hey, Rachel. Uh, the grey stone, I, first of all, I love the grey stone. Uh, second, it actually was, with all the Jack West books, I, I try to create a reality to it, to to explain how these giant underground complex booby traps could actually be built or work. And so the notion of Greystone was coming up with something which could be moulded into giant constructions and giant shapes. Uh, and then once I, once I had that idea that you could, you know, drop this powder into water and have it solidify, then I just got to have all these really fun extra things to do with it. And I had an enormous amount of fun with the Greystone in Three Secret Cities. And it's still there in uh, Two Lost Mountains and it will make an appearance in the one something something. Uh, so uh, Greystone, uh, and, and believe it or not, there, is, there are still a couple of things I have not done yet with Greystone, uh, so it will be used in just awful, awful ways in the next final book. Excellent. I, I, I promise I'm a very well-adjusted young man, but, yeah, when I get to use these things in awful ways, they're really, really awful. Now, Brooke's asking, have you spent time with Jack Westish characters during your research? Do they really exist? Ah, that's a really good question. Uh, yes, they, they do. Uh, I won't mention his name, but, you know, back when I was living in Sydney, I, I actually had a fan who was with the uh, 2nd Commando Regiment. He was a major. And he, he was working at Holsworthy. He had me out to their base. I, I got to sort of be shot up in a terrorist exercise and, you know, be there when live grenades were being thrown. And these guys from 2 Commando are just the most amazing, talented, skillful soldiers you've ever met. Uh, and he was pissed at me because I made Jack West the SAS. And he said, it's always those show ponies at the SAS that get all the press. Two Commando are just as good and they kick the SAS's butts if they had to. Uh, so, yes, there are real Jack West-ish characters out there and I have met them. <coughs> Very good question. All right, everyone. So, so uh, Gian has asked, how did you come up with the detailing of Hanging Gardens of Babylon? It was structured excellently. Yeah, I love my Hanging Gardens. Uh, this was when, when I sat down to write Seven Wonders, and you can see my, my poster up there. It's one of my favourites. The Hanging Gardens was always going to be a showstopper. Uh, it's the one wonder which no one's ever found and people wondered if it was the product of, you know, the imaginations of ancient poets. So I knew my hanging gardens uh, had to be a really show-stopping sort of image. And, again, that was one of those first images that I really sketched out and drew. And I loved the idea that they were literally hanging. They were literally a giant sort of stalactite uh, the size of a pyramid, uh, you know, hanging over the top of an actual sort of step pyramid. So it was something I planned from the start and it always had to be sort of visually 
stunning. Um, and then, you had, then I had to make sure I came up with the reasons that it had not been found. Uh, and I liked the idea of, you know, the courses of rivers changing uh, over the centuries and hence why, you know, this is the difference between the Jack West world and, say, the Indiana Jones world, that Indiana Jones is set in the 1930s when the world wasn't so easily explored, whereas with Jack, I've got satellites, we've got Google Maps, so I have to figure out more and more complex reasons for why these things haven't been found. Um, but yeah, thank you. I really, I really love my hanging gardens, and uh, they may well be referred to in the final book as well. <laughs> so many teasers. All right, and Crystal asks, do you travel a lot for your research? I used to before this year. Um, yeah, I had uh, I had two trips to uh, the UK uh, cancelled this year because of COVID. But over the years, I've been to the pyramids. I've been inside the Great Pyramid, which everybody should do. It's just, it's the oldest and the best ancient place in the world. It is purely mysterious. I've been to Easter Island in the middle of the Pacific, Stonehenge, Chichen Itza in uh, Mexico. Um, I, I love going to these places. Uh, even, even back when I did Seven Wonders and um, that picture at the start, which shows, you know, the image of death to grave robbers. I think I've got it here. Um, I got that not in a book, but in, oh, I'm not going to find it. Um, I actually found that in a tomb in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. So I couldn't find that in a book. I had to go to Egypt to find it. Paris, Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, catacombs, Rome, uh, with all of its obelisks. Um, I suppose it's a good, uh, it's a good jumping off point to say that the strangest things in the Jack West books are probably true. Uh, the fixation of, on obelisks in Rome is true. Why is there an obelisk standing in St Peter's Square at the front of St Peter's Basilica in the Vatican? Uh, why are there, what, 13 obelisks dotted around Rome, these, these notions of sun, these, these objects of sun worship? So... Um, the, the travel helps enormously and I really believe that my readers and even the readers here today, uh, when they're reading a book now, readers are Googling things as they read them. And so I think there's more of an imperative on me to make sure that most of the history is as true as it can be. And then I get to add, you know, the fictional elements to it. But, yeah, travelling to the places makes the books better. Even, even, you know, there's a big scene in over the Thames uh, in London in Three Secret Cities, which is one of my favourite action scenes in all the books. And I've been to London many times and often stood on that bridge and looked back at Big Ben and Parliament. And so that action scene has the detail because I've been there. And Sian writes, where is your most favourite place in the world ever that you have visited? Yeah, so um, so the the Great Pyramid stands out, um, and the other one, just for colour, is Easter Island. I mean, Easter. I mean, the pyramid is just big and old and mysterious, and the Sphinx uh, is just as mysterious. But Easter Island, you can't even fly directly there. You have to fly to Tahiti first, wait a day, and then fly. Must be what five hours to Easter Island. Now that is on a modern 737 aeroplane. Imagine, you know, 1,700 years ago, getting on a boat in Polynesia and just sailing across the Pacific and finding this island, which happens to be large enough to support some watercourses and rainfall to be held uh, so people could live there. These Easter Islanders were there for a 1,000 years building these stone statues. Uh, until they, till Europeans came and enslaved a lot of them. Uh, it is the wackiest, strangest place in the world. And the little fun fact, which I mentioned uh, back in Five Warriors, that the runway of the airport there is longer than a regular runway because it was the uh, emergency landing spot for the space shuttle in the Pacific, is true. It's true. So Easter Island... If, if you can't get to the pyramids, go to Easter Island. It, you only be there for, you know, 
three or four days, but it's wild. And David's asked, uh, who would you cast as Scarecrow mother or mother? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, you know, if Chris Hemsworth were to be Jack West, you know, we could go with one of the other Chris's to be Scarecrow these days. You could go Chris Evans, Chris Pine. Um, you know, I, I really grown to like Chris Pine. Um, I really enjoyed his turn in, in Wonder Woman. Uh, for Mother, um, you know, this has come up now uh, for, a, you know, I think it was an actress named Laverne Cox. I think she was in um, Orange is the New Black. Uh, I remember writing her name down once and saying that, like, she could be Mother. Just she embodied Mother. Um, but as I've said on numerous occasions, um, after I wrote Ice Station, people wrote to me and they said, oh, Mother was uh, African-American. And I've always said, nowhere in Ice Station do I say what skin colour uh, Mother is. And so I never have mentioned it in any of the books she's been in, uh, including the turn in The Four Legendary Kingdoms. So in your, this is why books are always going to be better than TV shows or movies, because if you thought Mother was white, she's white. If you thought Mother is black, she's black. But a television show or movie might have to settle the issue. All right, we've got another question coming through. Last question, all right. Brienne, Brienne yeah, from uh, Game of Thrones. That's, that's a good option too. I, uh, uh, Brienne of Tarth. Thank you. Who's that? That's uh, Mike. Good idea. All right, so last question from Natasha. Which is your favourite book out of all the books you have written? It's like asking what your favourite child is. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, uh, the, so there are two answers to that. Uh, one is that it's it's always the latest one because <laughs> if I wasn't buzzed about the latest one, I shouldn't be writing anymore. The new one always has to do something that the others haven't done. And so I sit, when I sit down to write every new book, it always has to be in some way better, faster, uh, have better characters, have better twists than the book which came before it. And... So it's always that the latest one is the one which I'm always sort of preoccupied by. The, it, and the second answer, though, is uh, the tournament is, is a book which it stands alone amongst all of my books. It's totally different to all the others. It was a book that I really felt I needed to write and... There's something about it uh, in the teacher-student relationship, in the uh, cascading series of murders, the chess, the comments about the church, the research I did for that, which showed that the church has had issues with um, uh, misbehaving priests for over a 1,000 years. It was just a story which it just sort of flowed out from my brain. So... Uh, so that, that's my answer to your question, that it's always the latest book, but if pressed, there's something about the tournament which uh, I'm just sort of kind of proud of. Good answer. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Matthew. Um, what have we got? Alison just got a quick comment here. Uh, watching while over the Indian Ocean on a car in Sydney, love how visual your writing is, love that technology allows them to link in. That's fantastic, Alison. You know, Alison, that, that is fabulous to hear. Um, I mean, COVID has stopped me doing the book signings in malls and the the events, you know, where we'd have 900 people in the Brisbane Town Hall. But I'm so thrilled that somebody can tune in on an aeroplane flying over the Indian Ocean. So if we're going to have lemons, we might as well make some lemonade. So I'm really pleased to hear that. And to everybody who's been able to tune in, uh, from all around the world. This is great. So there, there is something good to have come out of this, and that's that's great Wi-Fi on that plane as well. Good for you. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Matthew. Uh, good luck finishing the one dot, dot, dot. Um, and thanks for everyone who tuned in today. Uh, our next Chapter 1 event is tomorrow night. We've got Craig Sylvie, the author of Jasper Jones, who will be talking about his new book, Honeybee. 
Uh, and if you haven't bought Matthew's new book, remember, buy yours now from Dimmicks. If you're not a book lover, sign up. It's free to become a book lover and you could go into the draw to be a character in the next and final Jack West Jr. book. Uh, thank you again so much, Matthew, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy the book.